Y'all can turn back to Romans 9. We'll pick up where we left off. <clears throat> we'll just start in verse 22. Alright. Did God, first off, does God own everything? Yes. And do what He wants with it. Yes. What people read into these verses is that God cruelly and with malice picked a group of people to punish and that ain't at all what it's saying. What it's saying is the whole shooting match is worth punishing and yet in the long suffering and mercy of God he he does and he holds off, doesn't he? How many people have you ever thought about that's I mean, I always think about the guy that wrote uh, Amazing Grace, right? Guy was a slave trader. I mean God, he's killing people. Somebody's sick, they'd rather than give them medicine or feet, throw them overboard, right? Yeah. And yet this guy, through God's long suffering and mercy, did he come unto a point where he saw what he was and got saved? Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a merciful God, isn't it? All right. <clears throat> he says in verse twenty two, What if God, willing, he was willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that, he did this in order that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now, afore prepared, right? To, to understand this, all we got to do is the same letter he had already told him. Look back in chapter 8, verse uh, 28. He said, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. By the way, real quick about that verse. You talk about a misused verse. Mm -hmm. I had a family member one time that basically robbed me blind building a house and quoted this verse to me. <laughs> In other words, what he was saying is it didn't matter what kind of sinful evil you do. If you're God's people, you, you come out on top, right? <laughs> Folks, this is talking about exactly the opposite. Paul's saying, I know you're going to suffer in tribulation, but just remember, no matter what horrible things you go through on this earth, they will work out to your good at the judgment seat. He's not at all saying the reverse. Okay? Now he says 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What was God's plan all along to establish the nation Israel as his spiritual priesthood? Or this group of people over here? Yeah. Knowing what man was going to be before the foundation of the world, did God set aside His Son to be a sacrifice for sin? Yeah. Well, since He did that, what did God foreknow about people? They were going to be sinful and rotten. Adam was going to do what he did, right? But He also knew that there would be those that would believe. And did He create a special position for those that would believe? The household of faith. All back here, all during this time, I've got these blue lines going down. Were there people starting back here with Abel that we know about that believe God? Yeah. Yeah. And yet they went down when they died. Are they of the household of faith? Yeah. Yes. But how are they going to get saved before Christ dies for their sins? Okay. How is He going to give the Spirit of the new covenant unto them before the new covenant is established? So what did they do back here? They went down. Paradise is down. Now, over here... Did God have this plan all along? Yeah. Then what did He predestinate? For people to be conformed to the image of His Son. How? By a spiritual union with Him. Now He says, uh, back over in chapter 9, when it says, Those which He had for uh, prepared unto glory. Now watch verse 24. This is what we're going to start talking about. Even us. Okay? Paul's one of them, right? Was there ever, can y'all ever think of a character that deserved killing more than Paul? Yeah. I mean, honestly, think about this man. What You know, this is kind of, if you just, sometime when you're driving, just think about, in, in common sense, just don't get so caught, think about, okay, I got this guy who is the most religious of all Jews, right? And who is God going to send him to? The Gentiles. Y'all thought about that? He didn't even want to go to other Jews and wasn't Pharisees. What did Paul, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, think about the Jews of the other denominations? Filthy, unclean, rotten, and who's God going to send out to the Gentiles? This man. Now, he says that he was the first one that was shown all long suffering. Paul is the epitome of what we've been talking about. If there was ever somebody that should have been just absolutely destroyed, it was Saul of Tarsus. And yet in the long suffering and mercy of God, what did God do? He put up with all of that knowing there was a day coming when Saul was going to be saved. Did Saul 
curse the people of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did God had said? He said to Abraham that he would uh, curse those that cursed Abraham's seed, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Who do we find out ultimately Abraham's seed's referring to? Christ. When Paul is on the road to Damascus and the Lord knocks him down, you remember what the Lord said to him? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? This man had been persecuting the seed of Christ. Why? To persecute his own body. Folks, this man, of anybody that's ever lived in the entire Scripture, no one persecuted the seed more than Saul. He not, look, the Jews back here persecuted the seed <coughs> physically, didn't they? This man persecuted the spiritual seed of God because people believed in the Lord. He killed them and imprisoned them, didn't he? This guy, above all people that ever lived, ought to have been cursed and done away with, and God saves him. That gives me some comfort. Mm -hmm. I know as rotten as I have been in my lifetime, God held off till the day that I could trust the Lord, knowing it was coming. All right, so Saul is this man, and yet he's going to send this joker out to the unclean dogs. He's going to take the cream of the religious crop and send him out to them. That, that, mm -hmm. that always kind of tickles me. Now he says, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, then is there any difference? No. Now we've, we've been told there's a difference. There's not. Watch. As, in other words, this is according to the scripture, just like the scripture said. As he saith in O.C., that's Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Now, in Hosea, we're going to read it in a minute. <clears throat> Hosea is written unto Israel, right? Israel had the scriptures, and it's saying Israel had been cast away, and yet God would be, they would be able to be his people again, right? But was there a deeper, more mysterious spiritual meaning? Yeah. All through the scriptures, these things that Israel was focused on the flesh had a spiritual meaning, didn't it? Now, I know this physical people, Israel, in the context, exactly what it says happens is going to happen to them, right? Mm -hmm. But think about this. Had the nations been God's chosen people? Yes. Had they been cast away and scattered? Mm -hmm. Are they going to be received again? Yep. Mm -hmm. If a Jew could believe it in Hosea, Paul saying, hey, it's written right there on your page. You're believing the microcosm about one little set of tribes. Why can't you believe it about the whole world? Hey, now, let's go see what Hosea says. Um, Hosea, we need to read 2.23 first. Go back right after Daniel. Chapter 2, verse 23. Yep. Alright, in Hosea 2.23 he says, Now again, in the context he's talking to Israel, but... There's a whole deeper meaning that Paul's getting revealed unto him. He says, I will sow her, now this is Israel, unto me in the earth. If you sow seed, what do you do with it? You plant it, but how do you plant it? Now, me and you bury it. How broadcast. That's right, broadcast. You scatter it, don't you? Right? He said, I will sow her, Israel, unto me in the earth. I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Now I know when we read that, all we ever think about is Israel. Paul saying, uh-uh, goes far more than that. It's all the move. Had God scattered the Gentiles in all the earth? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Israel, this happens later. He's saying, hey, y'all need to look past yourself. You need to look to before the scripture was written. God had done this to the Gentiles back here, hadn't he? Now watch the verse again, 23. I will sow her unto me in the earth. I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. All during this period of time, were the nations part of this? No. The nations were scattered, weren't they? But what's going to happen to them? They're going to be brought back in. And he says, I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Could the Gentile uncircumcised say back here, He's my God and I'm His people? No. no. Can you say it over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All along, God was talking about this people. Israel's just a little example, folks. This is the little physical example of the type <laughs> or the shadow of the whole thing. 
And yet Israel thought this is what it was all about. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if God all along was going to call a group of people His people, which were not His people, He's not talking about Jew or Gentile. He's talking about Jew <coughs> creatures. Right? Hey, flip, hold Hosea because we're going to come back. But flip over to Ephesians 2. This is the fulfillment of this right here in Ephesians 2. And Paul says this is just like the scripture said. And he's right. It's exactly what it says. Ephesians 2.11. He said, wherefore remember that ye Gentiles, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Folks, during this time when this covenant is in effect, the Gentiles didn't have God as their God. They didn't have the promises. They didn't have the Messiah. They were just what this verse says. They were on the outside looking in. He says, uh, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Then had these people who were not his people now been made his people? Yes. Was it through the reestablishing of the old covenant? No. no. It's through this. So all along, look what we've had. What we've been. This has kind of been flipped around on us. We've been treated or told, and look, and I've taught y'all, and I'm sorry, that like this is the desired product. Like all along, God wanted to establish this group of people under this law and priesthood on the earth. That that's what he desired to do. And because they wouldn't, it failed. He went to plan B. And yet, in all reality, plan B is going to end because this is what he really wants and we're going back to it. No. I mean, that, you talk about putting... That's completely backwards. Yeah. Okay. All along, God was dealing with the Gentiles, wasn't he? He cast them away and started dealing with this people as a type or a shadow to show us what the real product is. It's this. Okay? Here it is. So the parentheses is here. This was added and it stops. The fulfillment is this. Now, over back over to uh, Hosea. <clears throat> Second part of what Paul quotes. Hosea 1.10. In Hosea 1.10 he says, I tell you, we'll read from verse 9. Then said God, call his name, Lo am I, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Right? Now back over to Romans. Romans 9 again, verse 25. Tell us, read 24 with it. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith, then is the calling of the Gentiles as the Scripture said. Yeah. yeah. As he saith in Hosea, Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people. Had Gentiles been his people? Yeah. No. Yeah. Was Israel also the ten tribes cast oh, away? Yeah. yeah. Will they be called his people? Yeah. You know who was considered not his people at the cross? The Gentiles had been cast away. The ten tribes had been cast away. And at the cross, who? Judas cast away. What's that make the entire planet? Not my people. Now, who can come into the new group of people? The entire planet. Okay. So he says, um, verse 25 again, As he saith in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass. Now Paul's saying this is happening. He said it's as this is happening. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living God. You know, my granny used to have this saying, uh, okay, when you got mad or upset, say somebody, she would say you got the lip. I guess your lip's sticking out, right? 
And I'd say, well, you know, my, like my sister, Gina's got the lip, Granny, and she'd say, well, she can get glad in the same drawer she got mad in. She'd say that all the time. Y'all might have heard that one. What did she mean by that? She, she'll get over it just right there where she can sit right in that chair and get happy just like she got mad, right? Yeah. What the Jew was teaching, and what we've been taught, was that in order for Gentiles to be saved during this period of time, they had to come into the fold of Israel, didn't they? You know what Paul just said? Yeah. They'll become my people on the same square of ground where they became not my people. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Could the Jew inside the temple in Jerusalem hear the gospel and be saved? Yeah. Did the Gentile outside the wall need to go into the temple to hear it and get saved? No. How about you? Did you have to go to Jerusalem? Did you have to get circumcised? Did you have to become a Jew? Did you have to go anywhere? You mean to tell me you can get saved in the same spot where you were called not my people? Yeah. Did he cast them into all the earth back here? Yeah. Can you go preach the gospel in all the world today and people yeah. get saved? You can. That's what he's saying. Now he says verse 27. Isaiah also. You know, if this mystery is not in the Old Testament, what's this man doing quoting it so much? <laughs> and he says, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Then was it ever going to be about that nation? No, it's going to be about a new group that was a sampling of all people, wasn't it? Now, let's talk real quick about something that's really important here. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Did Paul just use the context in Hosea? We'll come down here. Paul used Hosea. And who did he say it was talking about? Gentiles. Now he's a Jew. He said there's no difference. Jew and Gentile both were going to be called his people, right? Now watch who else uses this. And somebody explain it to me in the charts, right? Not my chart. The chart we always... You all know what I mean. 1 Peter 2, uh, 9, he says, But ye, whoever Peter's writing to, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises, not physical sacrifices, spiritual, the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me ask you something. If you're saved, can you make that claim that you've been called out of darkness into light? Yeah. Yeah. You can, can't you? Somebody said, well, this is just Jews. Hold your hand there and go to Acts 26. Acts 26, 17. Jesus tells Paul when he saved him on the road to Damascus. Acts 26, 17, he says, Deliver me from the people, that's the Jews, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Is he talking about Gentiles coming out of darkness into light? Yeah. Now notice what he says here. They're going to have inheritance, right? Among them which are sanctified. What tense is that? Right. Right. Then in Acts 9, on the road to Damascus, when Paul got saved, was he the first one or were there some people that were already sanctified? Right. Where's Paul's inheritance going to be? Among them. Was there any difference, folks, right here? In this period of time, let's just put it up here. Here's Jesus Christ resurrected and he saves the twelve. Right? And I'll come over here and say, here's Saul of Tarsus' salvation. Was there a lick of difference in Saul and those that came before him? Yeah. No. Is there a lick of difference between Saul and those that came after him? No. Saul said he was the pattern for those that were shown all long suffering. After three and a half years of this thing going to the nation Israel, God should have just said enough's enough and destroyed the whole thing, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But what did he do? He's been long suffering. Why? Salvation. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Alright, now, back over to uh, uh, 1 Peter 2. Let's read verse 9 again. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You all know what Peter just quoted right there? Hosea 2.23. Flip back over to Hosea yeah. 2.23. Right after Daniel again, Hosea 2.23. He said, I will sow her into the earth. I will have mercy upon her that have not obtained mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. Did Peter, to the people he's writing to, just quote Hosea 2.23? Yeah. Yeah. Now you'd say, well, he's writing mostly <laughs> to Jews. Well, I wouldn't doubt that. But did the statement in Hosea refer to the Jew just as much as the Gentile? Because yeah. they all been scattered at me. What had God done with the whole shooting match from Adam by the time you get to the cross over the course of 4,000 years? Guess what God de declared all of them? Unfit. Y'all think about the Passover lamb. God brings forth the sacrifice, or He told Israel, to bring it forth four days before they're going to kill it. And over the course of four days, what are they looking for? Any imperfection. If there's an imperfection, what happens? Can't be the sacrifice. Did God set aside Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world be a sacrifice? You know how He proved that that was righteous? Because for four days He examined every single human being that ever existed. And what did He find in all of them? Blemish and imperfection. Therefore, Christ had to die on the cross, didn't He? Now, if we flip back over to Romans. Um, over to... Uh, I think it's an 11. Yeah. Romans 11, uh, 27. Paul says, in Romans 11, 27, he says, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Did the old covenant do that, or the new? The new. The new. He said, as concerning the gospel, they, unbelieving Jews, are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Then I can't be racist against Jews, can I? I don't even need to look at it as being Jew and not Jew. I need to look at believer and unbeliever, and I don't need, need to be racist there, do I? I need to have compassion on the unbeliever and desire to fellowship and edify the believer. So he says here, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye, Gentiles, in times past, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Alright, had the Gentiles rejected God and been rejected, and yet now are they being saved? He's saying, how could you Gentiles look down your nose at the Jews? All they did was what you did 2,000 years before them. Right? He says next, 31, Even so have these also now not believed that your, uh, through your mercy they also may obtain mercy, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth, the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Israel was so focused on their books, starting with Genesis, that all they could see in their books was their nation and their flesh and their law and everything physical. And yet all they were were a picture of what had already happened before them, weren't they? Back over to Romans 9 again. Alright, he says again in uh, verse 27. Psalm. <laughs> he wants to just go in and out, in and out. Alright, 27 he says, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. That's true, isn't it? How many numbers are the Gentiles, you reckon? Mm -hmm. How many going to be saved? I'll call you back. Don't look like many, does it? 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, work. <laughs> That's kind of harsh, George. Right. <laughs> That's not bringing jammer. Yeah. He said, 
As Isaiah said before, except, except the Lord of Sabbath, Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been made like Gomorrah. Right? Now what's the Lord saying there? Unless God had left a remnant of Israel, believers, what would have happened to them? They had all been destroyed. If God saw them and there was none that was going to have faith, God could have just wiped them all out. But what held God's wrath off? Faith. Some had faith. What do we call those that are amongst the unbelievers that have faith? A remnant, and they're also called the salt. What's salt do? Preservative, right? Well, guess what? Same thing was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Exactly the reason God hadn't destroyed Israel is the reason He gave this bunch 2,000 years, right? Now, even among this bunch, God could have destroyed every Gentile on the face of the planet during Moses' law, didn't He? You know why He didn't? There's a remnant. It's salt. Somebody said, well, not under the covenant there's not. Hold there. Go to uh, Hebrews 11. Remember, those by faith that believed God put them in the paradise. It was down, right? It couldn't go up. Christ hadn't died. Sin's not paid for. New covenant's not established. <laughs> I just want y'all to see this group. Alright? Long before Moses' law, Hebrews 4, by faith Abel. And Abel was operating by faith before there ever was Moses' law, wasn't it? Verse 5, by faith Enoch. That's long before Noah's law, or Moses' law, isn't it? Verse, uh, look verse 6 real quick. Without <coughs> faith it is impossible to please him. Then what must please God? Faith. faith. Verse 7, by faith Noah. Folks, Noah's long before Moses' law, isn't it? By faith, Abraham. That's before Moses' law. By faith, there's through faith also Sarah. So we've got a whole bunch of people back here that are operating by faith before Moses' law, don't we? Well, someone would say, well, once Moses' law entered in, no, that was it. That wouldn't work anymore. What do we say Moses' law is like? A parenthesis. Does the idea of a sentence carry right through the parentheses? Does the sentence go away because the parentheses starts? Mm -hmm. No. The parentheses did start, and the parentheses was basically a big distraction to Israel because they got all focused on their flesh, didn't they? Now, watch me prove it to you. Come over to... Uh, Alright, we got Moses, but come down to uh, uh, verse uh, 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. You say, but well, they're under Moses' law. That's right. It, Joshua is a Jew, aren't they? But look at verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab. Uh-oh. Was Rahab under Moses' law? No. Did she have anything to do with that covenant? No. Did she marry a Jew to become? No, folks. She operated by faith. Watch what it says about her. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Then what kept her from perishing? She believed. Who perished? Those that believed not. It says, and what more shall I say? And you go on and on from there. So then, even during Moses' law, was God still performing His mysterious purpose? He is. Yes. Okay, back over to Romans. So are you saying that they say that faith is not operational in, Mo in Moses' law? Yeah. But it's, it's, isn't it still a, a, a picture, an illustration of faith? Because the faith is just shifted, shifted to the sacrifice. Because Moses' law wouldn't work without the sacrifice. You got to have faith in your sacrifice. But but the thing is, they didn't think what they did. They thought they were right because of that sacrifice, right? right? How about? Uh, I mean, you just come down through here, and all during this period of time, they're always thinking that it's faith plus works. We've been taught it was faith plus works. I've taught y'all. Ain't nobody's work ever saved them. Even offering that sacrifice. Don't get the idea either that they had to have confidence in that blood sacrifice. No. A lot of them didn't ever even got near a blood sacrifice. Did Rahab have a blood sacrifice? No. Did God save her? Yeah. By faith, didn't it? How about David? Think about David. Should David have even been allowed to live under the law? No. Folks, David went into the tabernacle and ate the showbread. What did the law say to do to that man? Then David obviously wasn't operating under the uh, penalty of Moses' law anymore, was he? What did David already have? Faith. 
was righteousness put to his account? Yep. Yeah. God wasn't viewing him under that. That law had done its purpose on David. That, you know, back to Romans again, 9. He says, uh, 29. Um, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as uh, Sodom and had been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? Here's the answer of it all. That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. Did Rahab in any way try and get righteous through Moses' law? No. Even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So then was God always imputing righteousness by faith? Yes. Yes. Then when did, the, when did the break in linear thinking come in? Under the law. Because what did Israel say? We're going to perform righteousness. Right. What was the law given to show? <laughs> okay. Ain't nobody ever performed righteousness, right? So he says, 32... Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. Can't say that about David, can you? Yeah. He says, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. This is fascinating to me. What was the law written on? Stone. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. Now watch what it's ultimately pointing to. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. <coughs> Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Who did that law really represent? Christ. How is Israel stumbling on Christ today? <laughs> Folks, Israel still thinking they can keep a law they can't keep and denying the only one that ever kept it. What's, key, what's the very first obstacle over here in 2017? What's the very first obstacle to a binationality, a Jewish unbeliever? There's no temple in Jerusalem. There ain't no well, think about this person though. I, I got a I'm strong here. I got a Jewish unbeliever here, right? I, I'm gonna put the little thing on this head. The, uh, yarmulke. Yarmulke. Okay. What is the very first obstacle keeping that guy from getting saved? The law. His religion. The law. Why? What does he think about it? He thinks he can keep it. Mm -hmm. You seriously think about it. The very first stumbling stone to this guy is he looks at that law and it doesn't convict his heart. He don't look at the nine he broke. He looks at the one he kept today. Y'all know we've lived like this. Haven't you ever lived in religion and focused on the good stuff you're doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. And when your mind would wander to the stuff you didn't, you know, yeah. right? Ain't that how we do? Mm -hmm. So then the very first stumbling stone to this guy is his own performance. This man thinks he has righteousness. This Jewish guy. Oh, go ahead, boy. Didn't you hear that in Birmingham from two Jews and a rest of them? Oh, yeah, Montgomery one. Someone yeah. on the rock that said they killed God, not they. Yeah, the sure did. That's what was there. Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. All right, so let's say that this Jew who's trying to keep the stones. I'm going to put the stones here, right? He's trying to keep them. And let's say after years of stumbling at him and not even seeing he's stumbling, just ignoring it, right? Y'all ever seen a drunk walking along and thinks he's walking perfect? Yeah. Yeah. He, my friend from Florida, one day we went in a, a store, a convenience store to get something, and it was. I watched him, he started walking like this, and I said, hey, 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 and he went down there and took out the whole end cap display. <laughs> he didn't even know how he was walking, he was just, right? This guy who's walking so crooked and so just perverted, can't see it. The very first thing this Jewish man, and folks, I'm going to take Jewish and just transfer it over today and say religious. The very first obstacle to this character, the Jew or the religious Jew, Christian so to speak, is he's going to have to see his total failure under performance. He's going to have to fall on those stones, as Christ said, and be broken. Remember when he said that? To trip over them is one thing. He said whoever falls on them, it needs to be broken, right? Mm -hmm. If he fell on them and got broken, then guess what would be his next obstacle? If he's a Jew, what's his problem now? I say, Jesus Christ, what's he say? Imposter. Doesn't he? Mm -hmm. If this guy would trip and fall over those stones, in my mind I, I've got a picture. He finally trips and falls and he comes face to face with those stones and he looks at them and he says, uh-oh, this is talking about a righteous man. Yeah. This is talking about a perfect man. I'm not that. Then all he needs to do is see the perfect man in them stones, doesn't he? 
who was the only one that could do any of this? Christ. So then this Jew has the obstacle of his own performance. That's got to get out of the way. Then he's going to have to admit something. I have been rejecting the only true Savior. I rejected the Messiah. My people killed him. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. Oh, that's a big job. Yeah. Seed to swallow. Yeah, here you go. Big <laughs> seed to swallow, right? All right. So then if this Jew would admit and see that this was indeed his Messiah, he knows he's got a problem and he's failed. Now he sees that Jesus was the Messiah and that his people crucified him. He ain't got but one more step. He needs to know why he did it, doesn't he? What can he now see? He did that for me. The whole reason he died is because of my performance against these two stones. He died because I cannot be what he was. He died for me. And if that Jew would believe that, bingo, God would save him, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. He'd save him right into the same body as me and you, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't there be any difference? No, no. None at all. Okay. <clears throat> now he says uh, again in verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now this is back to where he said he would, could wish himself accursed, right? He says, for I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, pretty much all religion does exactly that. They go about to establish their own righteousness, don't they? Mm -hmm. I don't care which one it is. How about a, uh, how about a, what's some guys down there in the bayou? They're uh, Buddhist, Buddhists. Yeah, what are they trying to do? They're trying to establish right. They're trying to establish righteousness. Might not be the righteousness that's outlined under Moses' law, but it's whatever Confucius or somebody else says. They're slowly trying to attain a position of higher spirituality, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Then are they trusting the work of someone else or their own works? Their own works. Right? That's also true of a person today who says they believe in Jesus Christ, but then you ask them about salvation, and what do they tell you about? What their they performance. Did. What, they did. What, what I did, what I did. That person needs to trip on the stones, mm -hmm. don't they? He says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In other words, is Christ the end of you trying to keep the law to get righteous if you believe? Yep. Does it say that since you believe, we ought to go murder people? Mm -hmm. It ain't saying that Christ is the end of the law for uh, being uh, righteous, is it? Yes. Yeah. In other words, what he's saying here is, God gave them the law to show them what they were, and they tried to use a law as a means of being God. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Then who's the only man that could ever stand before God and declare that he had the right to live? Jesus. And what did God have to do on the third day? Would God have been unrighteous in leaving his son there? Why? Because he kept the law. The law said the man that does them shall live in them. Did Christ live in them? And how could a righteous God deny that? He can't. Now he says verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith. Now, me and you can't keep that law, can we? Me and you better fall under this one. Here's what faith says. Righteousness that comes by impu imputed uh, through faith. Speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring God down from above. This is a quote from Deuteronomy. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now does that mean that there is a formal public confession that has to be made? No. What kind of confession are we talking about here? What's this guy first need to do? He confesses failure, doesn't he? Is Look, 1 John says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Religion turned that into a one-on-one -on -one Catholic thing. Confess this sin that He'll forgive it, right? Mm -hmm. But for me and you, you can't say that. that applies just as much to me and you. It's not some public confession. If I am ever going to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior who died for my sins, what am I first going to have to admit? Totally. I'm, a, I'm a ruined sinner. I'm going to have to confess to myself what I am, ain't I? 
If I won't admit what I am to myself, how in the world am I ever going to trust Him? I can't, right? Now, even after salvation, there are people that say, well, if you confess your sins, you're lost. Look, I'm, I don't confess my sins and beg God for forgiveness so I don't go to hell. But, what about the way me and you carry ourselves and things we do and all? Can it affect your ministry? Yes. Can it affect your ability to talk to people yeah. you want to talk yeah. to? Yeah. What's wrong with telling God, Lord, I keep fouling this up. Look, I don't want to do this. Help me with this. Help me overcome that. Is there anything wrong with that? Yeah. All right, so then under this particular situation, I've got this Jew here, and this Jew thinks he can keep the law, right? Now, the law said if you find sin, what did you need? Sacrifice, right? So this Jew who finds out he sinned, he says, oh, wait a minute. Christ was the sacrifice for my sin. He said, but I've got sin. I need a sacrifice. What's he going to have to do if it's physical? He's going to have to bring Christ down again, isn't he? And what's Paul telling him? No, you don't need a sacrifice. It's faith. It's faith in Him as your sacrifice. Not that you need one. What this person needs to do is confess something. Now remember we're talking about a Jew here. When a Jew brought his sacrifice to the altar and set it down, what did he have to do? Had to put his hand on its head and confess his sin. I, I don't mean, look, I've been cheating with Miss Schwartz and I robbed Goldstein. I'm talking about that. What he had to do was confess, I have failed. I broke the law. The law requires death. I ought to die. Here's my substitute. This person, spiritually speaking, needs to put their hand right on the head of Jesus Christ and confess, there's my sacrifice. This person needs to do what that person was doing. They have to be identified with that animal. Well, how does a person get saved today? You get identified with Christ. When you accept that this is your sacrifice, that Jesus Christ was the payment for your sin, not only are you identifying yourself with Him, but the very moment you do that, where does God place you? In Christ. And that's a baptism, which Scripture says was an identification. So then you and I get saved, not through bringing Christ down to die for my sins again. Look, that's what Hebrews 6 is all about. Hey, they're always wanting to, you know, we gotta, if I fall and fail, I'm going to sin again. He said, no, that's impossible. All right, so then this person over here who's Jewish has got all these obstacles they've got to overcome, don't they? Did Satan see the way legalistic thinking affected the flesh? Yeah. Was it effective yes. to keep them from, yeah. So what did Satan do? He established legalistic religious thinking. Folks, Satan has blinded the world through the pattern that he saw here. He ain't ever had an original thought in the entire scripture. He watched from back here all the way down through time how God dealt with man and how man always fails and Satan knows exactly how to trip man up. And it's not by sin. It's by self-righteousness. Okay? If you come over on this side of the cross, you find out that... All right, we've done this before. Let's do it one more time. The word religion... Okay. Religion is religa. It means the act of binding back again. Alright? This Jew here sees that he's broken one of these laws, right? So he knows that there's something that has to be done to put him back in right standing with God. He's considered himself ceremonially unclean. He's got out of the camp, whatever you want to say. He knows because he's aware of some sin that he's now got an issue between him and God. Well, what is he now seeking to do? Bind himself back to God. And what's he going to do that by under the law? A sacrifice. Well, you and I over here today realize we've got sin. I realize I need to be bound back to God. But my problem is, if I go into religion to do it, all they're going to do is give me some modern day sacrifice to offer. Go down to the altar and turn over your heart. Walk the aisle and give your life to the Lord. Invite Him in and all that, right? Folks, I don't need to invite Him down from above, as Paul said. I don't need to bring Him up from below. Over here, I need to admit my absolute and utter and total complete failure in all things and know that if Christ don't die for my sin, I'm going to hell. If what Jesus Christ did isn't enough for God, then I'm going to get what I deserve. Thank God it was enough and I don't get what I deserve. Then I embark on a life of being a servant of God and it's up to me if I ever want to serve Him for a split second. 
But if I'm ever going to serve Him in anything, you know what else I'm going to have to admit? If it's ever going to get done, He's got to do it. That's what this entire new covenant was about. It was about the Lord showing us for 4,000 years that man can't, won't, and ain't going to do it. And if I'm ever going to have righteousness on this earth, it's going to be me that's going to have to do it. Therefore, today, if you are saved, you in this vessel are walking around, and yet where's righteousness at? It's in that vessel, and it's in that vessel in spite of me and you. Yeah. Now, can I go serve the Lord the way I desire to serve Him? If I'll see it ain't me and I can't do it, don't depend on me. Folks, I mean, I'm telling y'all, I'm undependable. Okay? I do not have the capacity to do the things I ought to do. But, what did the new covenant make possible? Go to Colossians 1. One more verse. I said one more. I lied. There's going to be two more. <laughs> Y'all owe. <laughs> Alright. Colossians 1.24 Paul is going through some horrible things. And watch what he says. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Well, what a statement. <clears throat> Folks, why in the world would Paul say he was rejoicing in the sufferings? Okay. See bring, that's right. They're bringing about a result and it ain't him doing it. And guess what? By him just submitting to being used, it's producing a reward for him. Yes. So he said, uh, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, where I am made a minister according to the dispensation or dispensing of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The, the mystery was the last revelation that had to come known here. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then if Christ is in the vessel working, can the, can the work get done? Yeah. yeah. All right, one more. Go back to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 1. You know, there's a teaching that's real prominent today that they teach that you got no. There's, Paul said we're complete in Christ, and we've got all spiritual blessings. So if you pray to God about anything physical, that's just a waste of time. Oh, that that's crazy. Okay? Yeah. Paul said to go pray to God about all things. Yeah. Right? Now he says in verse thirteen, watch what he's praying here. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So bowing his knees means he's going to pray, right? Mm -hmm of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that, now watch what his prayer is, that he would grant you, not that you would earn or grow into it yourself, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, what's the only thing that makes this possible? The new covenant, he says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now he's talking to saved people. He's not praying that they would be saved. He's praying this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, <coughs> then you ain't going to be able to feel it, are you? That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with pat which passeth knowledge. Paul's praying that they could know something that passes knowledge. You know what that tells me? It ain't about my human understanding, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, it passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. What's he praying for these people? That their vessel be fulfilled with the knowledge and the love of Christ. How in the world would this be possible if it's me and you doing it? Mm -hmm. it, ain't, it ain't up to us. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Paul knew what he just said was a mouthful, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He said, the Lord's able to do exceeding abundantly. Y'all know what exceeding abundantly? Abundantly means abundantly, right? Mm -hmm. Exceeding abundantly means I can't put into words how much he can do this. According to the power that worketh in mm -hmm. us. What power is that? Power. The Holy Spirit of God. Now. What's the only thing that makes that spirit possible in a, in a vessel? It's the new covenant. That's what he promised back here in the new covenant. I'll put my spirit in them and cause them to do these things. Now how do you and I 
access this type of grace, knowledge. How do we get it? By faith in the Word of God, study, prayer, asking, met folks, communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, thank you all very much. Thank you.